Okay, welcome everybody to this panel on political parties in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This event is organized by the European Network of Political Foundations, INOP, at the occasion of the International Day of Democracy. My name is Bent Nikolaisen. I'm the co-chair of uh, the Working Group on, of Democracy of INOP, and I'm working for the Danish Liberal Democracy Program. Uh, today's panel is a part of the Democracy Week organized by the European Network of Political Foundations together with the European Endowment for Democracy, European Partnership for Democracy, International Idea, and Carnegie Europe in partnership with the European Parliament. I could also have started by saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening because we have uh, panelists and most likely also viewers from uh, different parts of the world. And we might not have organized an event in this way uh, last year. Uh, I'm not sure last year we could be able, because then we would have the event in Brussels, that we would have such an interesting panel uh, in, in, in one, one event. So, of course, we will talk about a lot of challenges and problems coming from COVID-19, but maybe once in a while we will also look at these new opportunities and new ways of doing things that this uh, situation have brought us into. Um, just to say a little bit about the organization behind this event, INOP, the European Network of Political Foundation, Foundations is a European network. We have uh, 54 member uh, foundations in 23 different uh, European countries, representing six different uh, European party families. So this is across the board of different political uh, ideologies. And uh, something of the same, I think, can also be uh, reflected in our panel today that they have that thing in common, that they are in opposition in each their country. But I think if they were belonging to European parties, they might also be found in two or three uh, different political families. Uh, and that makes it maybe even more interesting to participate in work like this and an event like this, that we have this common belief in, in democracy and diversity, and we also have our different opinions and different ideologies. Uh, the panelists who you will meet today is uh, um, Mrs. Ma Natasha Mazzone, who is the chief whip of the uh, Democratic Alliance in, in South Africa. It is uh, Mr. Julio Borges, uh, who was until recently the, the chair of the National Assembly in Venezuela. And it's Mrs. Macris uh, Caberos from the Philippines, who is um, the president of the Akabai uh, party and coordinator of SOCDEM uh, Asia uh, network. Uh, the program which we will uh, follow today will be that these three uh, uh, esteemed panelists will each be given 10 minutes to give an account on the situation in, in, in their country, what is it like to be an opposition party in these times of COVID-19? Uh, and uh, after these um, 10 minutes each, each, we will have a question and debate uh, session. It will be so that uh, this event is broadcasted on, uh, on YouTube, so viewers can uh, write their questions there, and we will take up uh, some of the questions we can promise that we will read all the questions. We cannot promise that all the questions will be asked to the, the panelists. Uh, and if you don't do it that way, you can also uh, post questions um, via Twitter and then use uh, the hashtag Democracy Week 2020. Yeah, I don't think I will waste much more of your time. So I will pass the floor to uh, Natasha Mazzone from Democratic Alliance South Africa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bent, uh, to all my panelists. Good afternoon from a, a very cold and wet Cape Town, 
in South mm -hmm. Africa. Um, we are at the point where our president has announced that he will address our nation tonight. And we expect the announcement to be that South Africa will enter into level one lockdown. We uh, have experienced the longest hard lockdown in the world to date. Mm -hmm. We started our lockdown on the 27th of March, being given uh, 48 hours in which to prepare for a level five lockdown, which saw us having to leave our places of work, having to leave our families, um, having uh, no, no right to leave home unless going to the pharmacy or to buy uh, necessary food supplies. I'm sure like many countries in the world, we experienced the um, mass buying of uh, food and uh, toilet paper, something which uh, I think the whole world is still grappling with the question why the worldwide pandemic on toilet paper. But nonetheless, these are things that happened uh, across the globe and, and we had to adjust very quickly. Now, uh, we're in an interesting position. South Africa is a country that operates in a federal system and we have nine provinces in our country with 11 official languages. The Democratic Alliance, which is my political party, uh, is the governing party in one province, which is the Western Cape. When the COVID pandemic hit South Africa, the Western Cape was the most hard hit initially, um, having the highest numbers of COVID cases. And the reason for this is because we boast the city of Cape Town, which is known worldwide as uh, the number one uh, tourist destination, um, something which we are incredibly proud of. So we had an enormous amount of foreign visitors who came for our summer season, which was over the uh, January, February and March period. And as you know, in Europe, that is when COVID uh, was hitting its, its peak. And uh, of course, many people uh, were ill in, in the country. Uh, and at that stage, we did not know. Uh, today, in fact, we got the wonderful news that we were one of the uh, first uh, provinces and certainly in the not only our country, but in the world that managed to put up a, a 800 bed intensive care unit with oxygen at each, each machine, uh, each bed within a six week time period. And uh, we are very proud of the fact that uh, we used the lockdown period for exactly what it was intended, which was to prepare us to reach the height of the virus. Uh, and we were never under the impression that the lockdown was going to stop the virus from spreading it, but certainly give us time for preparation. Being in opposition, we of course have encountered some very uh, serious difficulties. In our country, uh, probably the biggest difficulty was the governing party, which is the African National Congress, the ANC, began what was known as the COVID Command Council. And this command council uh, directed COVID operations across the country and was not accountable to the Parliament of South Africa. And the Parliament of South Africa is made up of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces, which is our uh, version of the Senate. So this command council operated very much uh, in a cloak of secrecy. And many, many decisions were made that uh, we as members of parliament could not hold the government accountable for because they were done uh, in this COVID council. But what we did get right was we managed to get our parliament operating in uh, the virtual platform. Uh, we got uh, quite soon, uh, my political party purchased uh, Zoom licenses, and uh, we have a shadow cabinet that shadows the cabinet of the governing party. We would meet uh, every second day and discuss uh, what we were going to do. We instructed all our shadow ministers to write to their counterparts to offer unconditional support and assistance where needed, because I think we can all agree in the time of a pandemic, one puts political ideology and political part partisanship aside, and you do what is best and necessary to save lives. In some cases, the, uh, the hand that was extended was, was grabbed and, and used, and in some cases completely ignored, but that is to be expected from, uh, from governments. That's just the nature of politics, unfortunately. But um, I do think that we were able to contribute greatly where we could. 
Uh, the Shadow Cabinet, uh, as I say, met on a regular basis. And what we would do is uh, twice weekly, the leader of our political party would broadcast live on YouTube, Facebook, and other social media, uh, what we called the Corona Cast, which was uh, an update on the news that we as a political party had not only about the province where we govern, but about actions that we were taking across the country. Now, unfortunately, uh, South Africa, as you know, is one of uh, the most viewed as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Uh, so we had to keep a very close eye on the corruption because South Africa entered into a stage where the Disaster Management Act, uh, which is one of our acts, came into, uh, into force, which means that the normal procurement and tender processes are set aside and uh, government can procure and give tenders uh, at will where they feel necessary. We uh, have a situation now where we have uh, an enormous amount of money that has disappeared during the COVID crisis. Um, I believe it has made international news, uh, so you will know what I'm, to what I'm referring. And uh, now comes the big job of finding uh, exactly where that money is and uh, who we hold accountable uh, for that money disappearing. But I do think that one thing uh, that the COVID crisis has done is it's certainly shown that the majority, 99.9% .9 of South Africans are giving and caring and uh, really want to see a, a workable and united country. We have seen a huge outpouring of uh, relief being given to those who are in the most destitute of situations. And we saw a, a massive amount of um, kindness being shown in, in feeding schemes across our country, as well as in schemes to, to make sure that people uh, were housed in a dignified manner and could uh, socially distance where necessary. Of course, we had a problem with the, the procurement of uh, PPE, um, as did the whole world at a stage. Um, but it was amazing how quickly South Africans adjusted and many companies who were in the manufacturing industries uh, quickly went into manufacturing sanitizers, um, medical grade equipment and of course uh, protective masks because South Africa immediately adopted the three layer mask system um, as advised by the WHO. So. Um, I think our biggest problem that we face now is uh, the state of our economy. The longest lockdown in the world, you can imagine, has had an immense impact on the South African economy. And in many cases, there has been a, a, a virtual decimation of uh, uh, certain fields. Our tourism sector and hospitality sector have been excep exceptionally hard hit. Um, we have a curfew at the moment, a 10 p.m. curfew, which means uh, the majority of restaurants will take their last order at 8.30 in the evening because staff have to leave by 9 o'clock to be home by curfew at 10. So uh, our hospitality industry has been very hard hit. Our international borders remain closed, so we have um, only internal tourism uh, that is uh, being able to take place at the moment. And uh, my, my strongest encouragement to the European community would be, um, as you start entering into your autumn phase, please join us in South Africa so that we can host you uh, for our spring and our summer season. Um, South Africa's tourism business is certainly open for business and we, we need you to come and uh, support uh, South Africa so we can get our tourism and hospitality industries back up and running. But uh, in, in terms of Parliament, we are now in our winter, re uh, uh, winter recess period, um, so Parliament isn't sitting at the moment, but we have been doing Parliament in the hybrid version. We have had 60 parliamentarians, a maximum of 60 parliamentarians in the physical house, everyone else joining on the virtual platform. And it has worked to a certain degree, but it is now time for Parliament to open its full complement and to show the country that we lead by example as members of Parliament, and that if our schools are opened and the economy is open, certainly the Parliament must open and we must do the business of the people. And with that, Bent, I hand back to you and thank you very much for the opportunity.
I thank you very much, Natasha, for, for that account about the situation in, in South Africa. And thank you very much for the invitation of coming back to your beautiful country. Uh, I will now uh, hand over the words to Jorge Borges uh, from Venezuela. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, all of you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, glad to hear about the situation that Natasha was commenting. And uh, I'm going to talk about Venezuela. A, a member of the parliament in Venezuela, and uh, I'm responsible for the international relationships uh, of the parliament and government of Juan Guaido. And uh, I, I want to be very clear with you, we have two important diseases in Venezuela, the COVID-19 and Nicolás Maduro. It's a real, real toxic uh, disease for Venezuelan people. I would like to invite you to read today the dossier from the United Nations in which the uh, fact-finding mission explains in detail every human rights violation that we Venezuelan are undergoing. It's a, it's a real dreadful uh, dossier about torture, about killing people, about using army force against Venezuelan people and also about our uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, I, I think that the problem in Venezuela is not an ideological one. Uh, Maduro wants to resemble the problem as an ideological one, a problem between the, la the left and the right, a problem between imperialism and a poor country in South America. This is not truth. Venezuela used to be the richest country in all the region, and now uh, their figures are the lowest in, in all the region uh, with the old war situation in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, the COVID also has been used as a tool against human rights. That's very clear. For example, uh, Maduro wants to uh, to develop a parliamentarian election on December this year. And there is no any political or social condition for that election. Uh, all our political parties, even though we are part of the parliament and we are very strong political parties and we have the majority of the parliament, all our political parties has been expropriated by Maduro. What means expropriated? It's not only that our political parties has been a ban by law, that we are out of the law. Uh, it also means that our party, in my case, Primero Justicia, which, which is the main party in the parliament, uh, our symbols, our colors, our properties has been taken out from us and has, uh, has been given to people close to Maduro. The same happened with the uh, party of President Juan Guaido and with historic parties in Venezuela. Their traditional leaders are not in their parties. Their parties were not only uh, banned by law, but also expropriated their properties, their symbols, and their colors, and given to people close to Maduro. Mm -hmm. And they want to make the election using our political parties in that election. But the real situation is that a, the COVID problem is a, is a very a blind and brutal force in the case of Venezuela. We have no figures. A, for example, between Colombia, which is besides Venezuela and Venezuela, in the case of Colombia, there are more than 100 a, places in order to, to make PCR a, examinations. In the case of Venezuela, there are only two more than 50,000 people are waiting for their results. And uh, the capacity of Maduro to make this PCR test is only about 800 per day. So we have a, a real blind spread of the disease in Venezuela. And uh, there is no real figures about uh, how it has been uh, spread the, the COVID in the case of Venezuela. People is asking to stop the election and to call to the European Union to go to Venezuela 
and develop a real political observation. But Maduro answer is that the election will be held on December the 6th, uh, yesterday, in, uh, in a daily uh, TV and radio change in which Maduro speak through all the system of media in Venezuela uh, by, by obligation and in the, it's a chain, all the TV sets and all the radio, he said that he will use militia and army force in order to go to the house of the people on the election day and push them to go to vote by force. So uh, I think in the case of Venezuela, we are living a real uh, important humanitarian problem and also, of course, uh, uh, a political problem that's the reason we are the second largest immigration uh, process in the world, following Syria. There are more than 6 million Venezuelan people abroad, mainly in Colombia, Panama, Peru, Ecuador, and Chile. Uh, many of them are also in Europe as well. And most of them are young people looking for a future that is not possible within Venezuela due to the economic clash and also for the brutal violation in human rights. So for us, it's very important to all political parties to join the situation in Venezuela, to go along with us in this situation in Venezuela. And I would like to underline that this is not a situation in which the ideology or the political ideology could be taken into account. It's a humanitarian problem. Is a real brutal problem of a dictatorship in the case of Venezuela. We have 20 years under this situation and uh, the thing is getting worse and worse in the case of the people. I, will, I, I, I may have thousands of uh, data in order to, to project the situation in, in the case of Venezuela, but uh, I will send through Alina all the information for all of you if you want to, to deep the situation in Venezuela. But uh, as I told you, Venezuela used to be one of the richest countries in the region due to oil the revenue. A economy, since Maduro is in power, has shrink, has reduced almost 80% of his capacity. We are living almost uh, with no oil, no gasoline, no electricity, no water. 80% of the hospital has no water right now and is a real uh, system that produce and use poverty in order to subordinate people to power. So it's a real critical situation with no dignity, with no appeal to human rights. And whatever I can say through words, is, it not resembles the, re the reality that Venezuelan people is living. So uh, I just want to make these uh, highlights and invite you to join us in this fight for freedom. It's a fight for dignity, it's a fight for human rights, it's not a fight for an ideology, it's a fight for, for help a millions of peoples in the case of Venezuela that have not the less uh, opportunity to eat, to work, to dream, to build their own destiny. And uh, we also, we would like to, to, to thank uh, the world that has been very uh, uh, with a lot of solidarity uh, regarding the case of Venezuela. But as in many countries, the issue of the COVID has been used as an, a tool for uh, suppress and to underline the totalitarian profile of the regime. So thank you very much for this invitation and I open for any question that you may have uh, in the case of Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter Borges, for giving us that uh, account of uh, a crisis which seems to have been more than enough uh, before COVID-19 arrived to your country. And uh, I also noted that you said it was a, it's a, it's a blind and brutal force, uh, also because you have no information and no possibility of, of, of testing people. Uh, so thank you very much for, for giving that account. Uh, then I will uh, move on to the Philippines, where we have Macris from the uh, Afghan party. 
uh, who will give us uh, an update on the situation in the Philippines. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ben. Good evening from Manila. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share what's happening in our part of the world. I am coordinator also of SOCDEM Asia, as Ben earlier said. We are a network of political parties from 12 Asian countries. And as I am based in the Philippines, I'll talk more about the situation here while also reflecting what's uh, not an uncommon thing in the region because prior to COVID-19 pandemic, there's really a crisis of democracy in, in Asia. And this pandemic has been used to further tighten the grip of populist and authoritarians in the region to further repress freedoms of uh, peoples here in different parts of Asia. We are now uh, in one of the longest lockdown uh, in, in the world. I've heard uh, Natasha earlier saying this, that the lockdown has been there since, since March. But what has got us is not a way out of the health crisis, but actually a looming recession and more unanswered questions and more um, non-solutions to current problems. What the lockdown was hoped for was to ease the burden um, of the health system and to lead us to uh, uh, at least an acceptable situation during the crisis. But it has gotten not in a better place, but in a more fearful, fearful place that the types of Duterte and his friends in the region would exploit to further tighten the grip, not only on, in the opposition, but in common families who are suffering amid the pandemic. I would like to share that prior COVID-19, the, the drug war of Duterte has been here since 2016. And this has not only uh, painted the fearful situation in Philippine democracy, but has actually uh, translated into killings and suppression of the opposition. So you can imagine that now where there is restriction in movement and even restriction in communication platforms, that the pandemic has not only restricted our health, uh, but also restricted how we dissent uh, against authoritarian tendencies um, in this part of the world. I would like to cite uh, policies that uh, the Duterte government has offered um, during the pandemic. So at first, we had uh, a law that was passed that enabled emergency powers for the president. My party leader, Risa Ontiveros, is the only senator who opposed these emergency powers on record. Second to that, this administration had pushed for the anti-terror law, which would cause detention arrests, surveillance for dissenters like us who are not satisfied uh, in the undemocratic governance of this administration. And this happens during the pandemic. Um, another stark uh, approach of this administration to the health crisis is a militaristic approach as if the bullets would kill the virus and not a vaccine. So this contrast uh, in the approach um, to other countries who are battling against 
uh, COVID shows that undemocratic leaders and undemocratic governments are not fit to combat this health pandemic. That undemocratic leaders and undemocratic governments are not fit to lead us out of the crisis. Because to begin with, they are part of the crisis. This is the crisis of undemocracy that exacerbates the crisis that is now pandemic on health and an economic one as well. So we are fearful that while our freedoms and liberties were already suppressed since 2016, the joblessness, the closure of businesses, hunger will uh, further create a, a divided Philippine society, a fearful Philippine society, and a society where dissent um, will, will really be uh, penalized. But I would also like to mention, as I've heard from my co-panelists, that of course it's not it's not all a, a, a bad picture in these times. We are seeing very promising acts of solidarity, acts of kindness, of cooperation among communities. Because if you cannot rely on a government that does not respond to their needs, communities bound together to help out each other and to attend to relief, attend to um, emergency health situation. And I would say like in our party, we have volunteer lawyers to attend to people losing jobs who do not have a recourse, what to do, uh, on jobs, uh, on their jobs that they are losing. We have volunteer doctors that are giving free consultation, especially to those who cannot go to the hospitals. We are also, um, in our own way, our members are also volunteering in the relief, humanitarian assistance with local governments. I think these acts of solidarity is also our acts of resistance against undemocracy and uh, non-solutions to the problems we have at hand. Um, as coordinator of SOCDEM Asia, I'm also proud that our sister parties in the region, like in Malaysia, we are pushing uh, back. Um, we, we, we won the elections before, and now party leader of our uh, Malaysian counterpart, Lim Guan Eng, has been arrested for fabricated issues. Our counterparts in Thailand are continuing the protests against the junta and democratic uh, forces. Our counterparts in India are struggling hard under Modi, but also making spaces for solidarity and relief assistance and are working with journalists um, because the media space there is so restricted that volunteer journalists, even in code name, would want to put out the real issues on the ground. I think these acts of resistance also is something we can highlight. Um, and that is very important where in our closing spaces in the Philippines and in Asia, in most parts of the world, these closing democratic spaces have to be opened up by solidarity partners. And, um, and I like what Enoch, uh, in your paper on the EU action plan, had put out. Uh, you released a paper on democracy and human rights. And I would quote, Enoch said that only under democratic order that we will ensure the protection of human rights. And this is more needed now during this pandemic. And we hope that our counterparts in the European Union, in the European parliaments, will look into the issues outside the European Union 
and see this as an opportunity for cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Chris, from, for that account from what you called a divided and fearful society, and also for your stories about how communities get together in times of crisis and, and help each other. And thank you very much also for bringing in the, the Asian perspective from some of these other big uh, countries in, in the region. Uh, so now we have heard uh, three different stories which does do not seem to be so very different actually, that uh, it seems to be a common denominator that uh, here are governments who are more interested in, uh, in using this opportunity for their own gains than uh, solving the, the, the problem. Um, I was wondering if, if some of you uh, have an, some ideas about when we imagine that this situation is, is over uh, and eventually it will be, uh, how has it changed you as political parties and the environment you are, you are working in? Is there any of you who would answer such a question? Natasha? And I think that one of the one of the things that uh, has changed us quite dramatically, uh, as you know, geographically speaking, South Africa is a, a large country, mm. and um, certainly the the crisis has brought home the fact that um, you know, especially as we are going into this economic meltdown in our country, it's going to be increasingly difficult. Uh, to have meetings of uh, politicians in our country uh, where we have to travel two or 3,000 kilometers uh, to get to one another in, in round trips. And I think that uh, the, the virtual platform has shown us a, a massive amount of ability to meet um, in a very cost-effective way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have already had uh, uh, our policy conference, uh, which we've done on the virtual platform, uh, very successfully so. And we have managed to have our, one of our first elective congresses um, in, a, in a province that is deeply rural. Um, and uh, we managed with uh, data connection and, and with limited resources, but we, we managed it. And I think the COVID crisis has fundamentally changed the way we will be uh, meeting um, in person um, in terms of traveling costs, et cetera, going forward. And um, certainly the worldwide, the economies are suffering and it cannot be uh, business as usual that we know for sure. So I think it's fundamentally changed the way we as a political party will uh, be operating uh, as we move across the country. Thank you very much. Uh, is that a similar situation in the two other countries? You, how you foresee you will act as a political party on the other side of the COVID-19 crisis? Well, yes. Um, te thank you. Te technology is really is 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 really helping us a lot to at least find spaces to engage mm -hmm. constituents, find spaces to engage and to hold account um, um, government officials. Mm -hmm. um, but this arena on social media, arena uh, on, on the internet. Um, also had had to be used um, in a way that also block misinformation, fake news, because it's not only us who, who use the platform. No. So it is an arena. It is an arena also that we must contest. It should be a. It should also be a democratic open space that we must contest. Mm -hmm. So while we would want to make use and optimize the use of social media and internet platform we are also wary on on the use of it to further misinform distort truth um which i think also must be part of uh, our looking at uh the space democratic spaces that is there because it is a a, a, a valuable tool not only for democratic forces but also to not, not democratic ones i think that's a very important point uh, 
Yes, well, uh, besides the problem that we are living in our specific countries, I agree with uh, Natasha and Macris about what they said. The COVID is a real political challenge for political parties. The public opinion uh, and the public conversation is reduced by the effect of this kind of uh, a crisis that we are living. So political parties have to be very skillful in order to build new ways to communicate to the people and not only, not only to communicate because uh, the networks and the social networks are not enough. I agree with that and are full of different uh, contradictory statements. We should be able to be alone with the people in their communities, in their houses and being a real uh, translators about what's going on in this uh, in this future. So I think that there is no other uh, tool for society, such as the political parties, in order to build this kind of uh, local uh, uh, familiar conversation with the people and building a new organization beyond the technologies, beyond the social media. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was another question coming from the audience, that is whether you, which kind of interaction you have managed to have with your sister parties in, in other parts of the world, if you have received any assistance in this difficult situation, and if you have any opinion on, on how the European Union has been acting in this situation. Is that somebody... Natasha? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the, the technology is teaching us to unmute and raise hands. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think that we're, we're all very much in, in a similar situation. It's, yeah. it's very difficult for um, the European Union mm. to assist, especially uh, opposition parties, because of mm. course, uh, the European Union have uh, delegations that they send to our country, mm -hmm. and of course they, you know, there's this thing that gets in the way of the truth sometimes, which is called diplomacy. Mm. And uh, sometimes we we really require um, uh, the diplomatic court to to step out of the diplomatic arena and and sometimes see uh, the, the real truth and the real uh, situation as it's happening on the ground and report back to the European Union uh, what they see and and not just what the governing party uh, will tell them and, and will have them know. So we do understand that it's a difficult sphere in which uh, to operate. But um, where we have had uh, support and, um, and what we have enjoyed is uh, building on our, our sister party relationships and the relationships with foundations that we have across the world to enable us to have conversations like the one that we are having today. Mm -hmm. um, and I belong to a, a, a liberal party. And as mm -hmm. we said, not all of us follow the, the same ideologies, mm -hmm. but all of our problems seem very much centered around the same breaking down of a, an attempt of dictatorship, combating mm -hmm. of corruption, and making sure that our political voices are heard um, in a time where the crisis and fear is being used to push an agenda harder than ever. So I think I, I, I'm certainly using the, uh, the connections that we can make on these, uh, these various webinars um, to, to our advantage, because it's very important for me to have the Democratic Alliance message sent out um, on a one-to-one -one basis. As, um, as uh, Yota said, and, and Marquis, the, the fake news and the propaganda, the machine is very strong in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And to overcome that when you're in opposition and you, you're, you're, uh, the party to which you're in opposition is as strong as it is, where in my country, the majority that the opposition, the, the governing party has is so enormous. It's virtually two thirds. Um, our voice sometimes doesn't feel like it can be heard loud enough. But given opportunities like the one today where we interact and people can ask us questions on social media, there is no opportunity for any blocking of the social media. There's no opportunity for any censoring. So it's, it's my chance to give you my truth. 
And I think that it's very important for us uh, as opposition parties to assist, even if your ideology isn't the same, our goal is the same, which is to broaden democracy and to do away with corruption. And we, we all need to assist one another in speaking our truth and, and, and stopping the fake news and stopping the, the dictators from, from giving their truth as the only truth. Thank you very much. And I think that's a very important point that in this conversation, we have people belonging to parties with different political ideologies, but in uh, fighting a common cause, which is fighting dictatorship, fighting uh, corruption, working for a broader uh, democracy. Uh, Macris, will you come in here? Yes, thank you. Um, Sokdim Asia, um, in the beginning of, of, of the crisis, had launched a webinar series of parliamentarians, politicians, not only to exchange notes on what's happening, but how to draw a program alternative to those that are not working. I think democratic parties around the world have uh, very good policies and practices that while we differ what's happening on the particularities on the ground, approaches to health, for example, approaches to how to um, ensure that the, the most vulnerable are not displaced, and that freedoms are not curtailed are important lessons that can cut across borders and can be aided by technology during this period. So if there are, when there are, it should be uh, easier for now to be able to share that, to strengthen interventions on the ground. But looking at these webinars, meetings, online conferences, I think there has to be also a push at the multilateral level on lobbying towards getting out of the situation in terms of the fight for vaccine. Um, this, is, this will be a long battle that can be uh, uh, initiated through talks like this, as Natasha mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Rodrigo Duterte saying that we will wait for Russia and China to lend us the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are more models to choose from. Maybe mm -hmm. there are more suitable ways of approaching this. Mm -hmm. And I think the battle for the vaccine um, would influence millions of people across countries. Mm -hmm. And conversations has to start now. It has to be transparent. Mm -hmm. And it has to be a, in a multilateral level. Mm -hmm. um, and also the recession, the economic recession. Mm -hmm. I know that even in first world, in developed countries, many people are displaced. But you know, Ben, I, Filipinos are everywhere around the world. We, we have overseas Filipino workers from different countries and governments, democratic governments from receiving countries. Um, there has to be a conversation about this um, on workers coming from outside, um, because these are also millions of people from, from Asia and from other continents. So these two, I think, preliminary needs a global uh, uh, um, conversation, and it can be done, and it can be done. Thank you very much for highlighting that global problems need uh, multilateral solutions. Uh, Hota Borges, how do you look at your relations to the outside world? Are we too uh, preoccupied with the corona crisis to remember the serious situation in Venezuela? Yes, uh, it's, it's uh, very important to highlight in the case of Venezuela that Maduro's regime is using the coronavirus uh, as used to, to use any dictator as, a, as an external enemy. Mm -hmm. So he's telling the Venezuelan people that this is almost part of the international war against Venezuela. Mm -hmm. 
he's telling people that this is people that come from Colombia or from the Caribbean or from Brazil in order to spread the disease in Venezuela. So he's politicizing the COVID in a way that he wants to create the atmosphere that is a, an external attack from the uh, uh, countries that are, are allied to the different uh, uh, potentials in the world. And um, also, uh, he wants to use the politics of the vaccine, for example. He's pro the Cuban vaccine, he's pro the Russian vaccine, mm -hmm. and against the others' vaccine. So it's a real nightmare in, in the way everything is used in political terms. There is no room for humanity, there is no room for dignity, there is no room for health. All Everything is used in political terms. So uh, the, the problem is that uh, the, the, the public opinion sphere is reduced and many people only have the information that comes through the official channels from the dictatorship in the case of Venezuela. Um, we are trying to, to push for help for the international agencies. We have achieved uh, some uh, small uh, achievement uh, for humanitarian help, but Maduro has been neglected to use humanitarian help and to open the country for different agencies or countries that want to help uh, Venezuela, because uh, we have been talking for this problem of the humanitarian help, as you mentioned, Ben, long before the coronavirus in the case of Venezuela. And Maduro said that every help from the international arena is part of the political attack to Venezuela. It's part of a kind of a hidden war against uh, the Venezuelan people that covers a kind of new, uh, uh, new kind of uh, attack from the political use of the empire against uh, Venezuela. So uh, we are fighting uh, this situation. Venezuela people, uh, thanks God, don't believe on that. But uh, it creates this kind of atmosphere of repression, uh, no, no way out, no solution, which is from the psychological point of view, very powerful. You, you, we should remember that at the end, uh, in dictatorship, all the fight is psychological is fear versus freedom, is freedom versus free consciousness. And this is the battlefield, which is a very, very hard fight of the battlefield to, to, to convince and to wake up the people for fight. Thank you. Thank you very much for that account. And it, what you were telling us also reminds me a little bit of a, your big northern neighbor who also had that tendency of saying that this is something coming from outside. Uh, but otherwise, it's also enlightening to to hear how the um, how this is used by a dictatorship uh, politically. I was wondering if wondering if any of you in the panel, since we have this interesting group put together from all over the world, if any of you have a question for somebody else in the panel, is that the case? Well, in my case, I, I would like to know more about the profile of the regime that is uh, uh, in Philippines in, in a way that we heard in the international uh, media, uh, good things about the government, bad things about the government. And I would like your, your, uh, your free propaganda uh, impression about what is the, the health of democracy in, in the case of Filipina. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there are good um, things that are put out there. Um, there are even awards put out there that uh, Duterte got an international award um, from different countries. This propaganda has been there since 2016. And this opportunity is very helpful for democratic forces in the Philippines to let out what's happening on the ground. Before COVID, it's 30,000 people killed. Now we are number two in the Asian region on the infections. We are nearing 300,000 um, COVID-19 infections. Um, so this, this really is a, is a killing government 
either we are killed in the drug war or we are killed um, uh, by, by the COVID or we might be killed um, if we dissent. This is something um, that is targeted to citizens when they pass the anti-terror law because we will be detained, we will be arrested, we will be under surveillance. So many human rights groups, democratic groups, civil society are, are, are really pushing um, to, to not let this happen in this very difficult time. So what's happening on the ground now is that the pandemic has created, uh, has restricted more the space where we can operate. There will be elections in 2022, very important. That's happening also in other continents. There are elections very important happening this year, next year, and until 2022. And if the tide of resistance would go strong, then the regime will also fight back to also tighten grip and maybe not even make elections possible. So our message is um, in these times where more, it is understandable that citizens of countries look more into their situation. It is very understandable during crisis, but the European Union has operated uh, not only in the confines of its member countries, but looking at its influence on a democracy, human rights uh, situation. And I think it has happened before um, that there are strong voices in the European Union through uh, parliamentarians um, shedding light on what's happening, not only in the Philippines, but also in Latin America, in Africa. This has to continue even during this crisis, more so during this crisis. So thank you for your question, for our free, free propaganda, um, mm. telling the truth is needed mm -hmm. more than ever. Sure. Thank you very much. I think we have come to the juncture where each of you will be given the opportunity to have a few uh, uh, concluding remarks uh, before I go on to my colleague, Dennis Fry. Uh, so, Natasha, what have you learned from this session and what would you say at the end here? Well, I, I certainly learned that uh, I, I'm going to be making contact with uh, a lot more of my um, my fellow colleagues across the world who are experiencing similar things to, to uh, what I'm experiencing in my country, um, especially in terms of combating corruption and certainly in terms of how we stop uh, a major regime from holding power. I also, I must say this because, um, you know, South Africa is made up of, of many um, uh, immigrants that uh, when I, for example, am a first generation South African with my family coming from Europe. And it's very important to me that the European Union and those living in Europe understand the circumstances in which we live. Mm. Because it's very difficult for um, your average European to understand that we do live in fear of being detained. We do live in fear of, of the government uh, making laws to make it impossible to hold elections. And we do, we do live in a, in a, in a fear of, of surveillance and unsafety because of your political belief. So while many in Europe would think of it as, as a scene from a James Bond movie, this is our lived reality. And it's very important that you give us the opportunity to tell you what our lived reality is, because if you don't hear it directly from us, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine. Um, and I have a government that uh, constantly, for example, applauds what is going on in Venezuela. That, that, that is the, 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 the governing party of South Africa applauds Venezuela.
and applaud what's happening there. And my party, of course, will, will fight with all its might to assist the opposition parties because it is our biggest fear that, that we should land up in a, in a similar situation as, as in Venezuela where the dictator has completely taken over or in the Philippines where a dictator has taken over. So we are on the brink, we are on the precipice, the, but we are on the cliff's edge and we are teetering ever closer to, to falling over that edge. So what certainly from my side, I, I find strength in having these conversations because mm -hmm. I see the I see the immense amount of work and the immense bravery of, of, of politicians around the world to fight mm -hmm. for democracy, to fight for individual freedoms and, and to fight for, for justice. And it makes me all the more determined to fight for that for the same causes. And then I'm reminded that the world might be a big place, but we are actually all part of a larger global family. And we have an obligation to fight dictatorships and injustices all over the world and not let fear dominate uh, our lives and dominate the work that we do and, and continue to strive for a, a freedom uh, of the individual to make sure that, that, that we live in the world that, that we dream of. And it's not, a, it's not an ideology, it's, I think it's a shared dream that we have for a, a free and democratic world that we need to fight for. Thank you very much for highlighting that shared democratic dream. Uh, and thank you very much for your contribution here, Natasha. Uh, Rosa Borges, for your final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for me. It has been a pleasure to share with you uh, our situation, our crisis in Venezuela, uh, underlying that, as Natasha said, is a human uh, crisis, not an ideological one. This is very mm -hmm. important. And I would like to encourage you as a network for political parties, as the European network of political parties, uh, the idea that maybe you can be open to a special cases like Venezuela, South Africa, or Philippines in order to work together, uh, putting uh, ideas besides, uh, ideology besides, mm -hmm. and, and making like an awareness in the political parties in Europe about mm -hmm. the human issues in South Africa, in Philippines, or in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So to, to, in order to get help from the European Parliament or mm -hmm. the uh, national parliaments and the political parties in, in Europe. So I encourage mm -hmm. you to think about the special group or commission in order to work uh, special cases as we presented today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for that uh, good point that there's something we can work together also across the political differences in, in Europe. Uh, Macris, for your final remarks. Well, thank you to Ina for, for, for this opportunity. Thank you to uh, my co-panelists. This, this is an enriching discussion. And yes, we need more discussions about this um, to surface our issues. We'd like to thank also our, our supporters in, in Europe. Um, um, our political family uh, from PES and SND has mm -hmm. been very active, but I know, we know that also the democratic parties uh, under the European Union and under the European Parliament are very supportive of the Philippine cause. Um, it, mm -hmm. Even before COVID, even before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. but, but this time, uh, as I've said in the beginning, only democratic governments can usher a way out of this pandemic, of this economic crisis. Mm -hmm. If we live to undemocratic government, undemocratic forces, mm -hmm. I am not very optimistic that we get out of this crisis mm -hmm. in a better place, in a better way. Mm -hmm. So if we are to usher a better, just normal after this, mm -hmm. with the cooperation of our friends from the European Union, then the cause for democracy should be at the heart of our fight uh, in combating the crisis of COVID-19. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for highlighting that only democratic governments can solve the crisis. Before we uh, end this uh, discussion, I will uh, give the word to Dennis Fry from Konrad Adenauer Foundation to give us some uh, closing remarks. 
Yes, thank you very much, Ben. And thank you also to all of uh, the speakers for your contribution. Um, I'm also sharing the Working Group Democracy in the European Network of Political Foundations together with Ben. And um, I have also spent some time in, in Southeast Asia um, observing the situation in Cambodia and the Philippines closely. Um, I can um, maybe see some, um, of course, interesting overlaps between the three countries um, in terms of long-term shrinking spaces. Um, this is probably a common denominator. Of course, we have different country contexts. In each country, um, the level playing field for opposition parties is different. The legal framework um, are different. The, uh, of course, also financial opportunities of political parties are different, but uh, you face similar challenges of, um, let's say, increasing authoritarianism by your governments. And um, this calls for, of course, regional cooperation, cooperation with global networks, with uh, different political parties to exchange experiences on your specific local context and also on solutions on how to overcome the current situation. So I just would like to stress that we as um, European political foundations very much believe in the importance of political parties as part of civil society, because you are the ones who have to sell and have to um, develop your policies at the local level in close communication with the citizens. And based on your communication, you develop legislative proposals. And such le legislative proposals will make it into um, legal acts and into decision making. Therefore, I think you are a really important actor and it is worthwhile about thinking on intelligent and sensitive ways of supporting political forces around the world, especially opposition parties, which face very, very serious challenges in their different local contexts. I'm not going to now suggest um, additional uh, actions or activities, but I would like again to also remind the European Union uh, of um, their responsibility today, Mrs. van der Leyen, she addressed the state of the European Union and she made it very clear, only in democracies, human rights can flourish. So the European Union, I think, is strongly committed to speak out with one voice, although this is not always easy. And also the European Union has not always been um, the best example when it comes, when I look at your countries. Nevertheless, there was a strong commitment today by the president of the European Commission to highlight the importance of values and the importance of democracy um, in the external dimension of the European foreign policy. And I think an important dimension of European foreign policy is also to engage with democratic actors in a broader sense. We are not talking about suppressing of opposition parties, but of the media. We talk about shrinking rule of law. We are talking about different tools authoritarian regimes are using to oppress um, opposing voices in each country. So I think the European Union is aware that they need to support with their instruments and programs, people like you, people who stand up and who dare to speak up and people like you who are brave and brave enough. And this is, of course, we are sitting here in. Uh, in Belgium and in, in Denmark, and um, we, we have um, a safe uh, democratic environment. But we, of course, understand very clearly that you risk your lives and that you risk um, on a daily basis, um, yeah, your, your reputations um, to, to fight for common cause. So again, let me thank you for your time, for your, for your commitment, and we will think about a continuous support, cooperation, and even maybe a more regional and global um, cooperation in the future. And also on behalf of ENOP, again, thank you for this opportunity to engage with you and to listen to you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Then it's just my task to say thank you very much.
to uh, the three panelists from South Africa, the Philippines, and Venezuela. And thank you to the viewers who we expect are from very many different corners of the world. I think this has been very inspiring and we look forward to continuing our work for democracy. So thank you very much. So in Venezuela, have a nice day. In South Africa, have a nice evening. And in the Philippines, have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.